In recent years, Nintendo's been collaborating with a lot of third-party studios, even buying up some of them. But before Namco, before Platinum Games, Team Ninja, Monolith, and Retro, Nintendo was most known for collaborating with a little-known British studio. Yeah, you know the one. They developed a lot of killer titles for the Super Nintendo and N64. It was even one of the very first developers that Nintendo trusted with a major IP of their own. Well, at least after the whole disaster that was the Philips CDI. Rareware was a really big part of what made Nintendo great, so imagine the sheer disappointment when Microsoft announces their full acquisition of Rare in 2002. It was barely the beginning of a new console era, and before they could really make anything for the GameCube, they were already gone. But Rare would leave Nintendo with one final game, a title that was, believe it or not, very highly anticipated, but at launch, it was met with both confusion and bitterness, not just because Rare was leaving, but also because of what this game was, Star Fox Adventures. You really couldn't cut it any closer. It came out one day before Microsoft announced their partnership with Rare at their second annual European trade show. One day. Star Fox Adventures had a little bit of a longer than usual development. Not only was it originally on the N64, but it was originally a different game entirely. Dinosaur Planet is what the game was first shown as, an adventure game for the N64 where you take control of two playable characters, Saber and Crystal. It was shaping up to be possibly the single most impressive game on the entire system, with its mind-blowing graphics and animations, impressive lighting effects, intuitive combat, and a sizable quest for the player to undertake. It really wasn't difficult to tell that they were really proud of this one, and the excitement surrounding it was fairly good. At E3 2000, they built this giant statue of Saber riding a dinosaur to promote it, and that statue still exists to this day in Rare's offices. Unfortunately, as of this video, a playable ROM has never been leaked on the internet. I know sometimes with unreleased games like Lover 2, that does happen. I mean, hell, the developers of Rayman one time found the original Super Nintendo build of it on a computer and they made it publicly available. I can only hope that someday the same will happen for Dinosaur Planet, but until then, we at least have lengthy gameplay videos that were posted online by Rare Thief. It's a little bit low quality because it was from a VHS tape, but you can still see how a lot of this game was before it made the conversion. Now, the official story is that Miyamoto was looking at Dinosaur Planet and noticed the similarities between their protagonist and Fox McCloud, and then he simply suggested reworking the title into a Star Fox game, but I don't know if I really buy that. I want to believe that there was a lot more business politics involved, you know, because that's usually how these things go. Some people speculate that this change was actually made to prevent Dinosaur Planet from appearing on a competitor's console. You know, the Xbox. Nintendo only owned 49% of the company, and Rare was facing offers from not just Microsoft, but also Activision. It's possible that Nintendo predicted Rare's departure and made the push to rework Dinosaur Planet into a Star Fox game because of it. I mean, if they're working with a Nintendo IP, they wouldn't be able to bring that with them to the Xbox, right? But of course, that's all just speculation. There's no concrete or definitive evidence that really supports any of that. I mean, for all we know, it could have been just an attempt to have it sell better. Star Fox was popular at the time, and it was definitely going to sell a lot better than a new IP would. It's just business. But regardless of how this became this, the people that weren't in the know were pretty confused when Fox McCloud's latest entry played closer to Zelda than it did Star Fox. This game is absolutely infamous for its radical departure from traditional Star Fox gameplay, and it's why hated because of it. I've heard the same sob story again and again. There was no Star Fox games for five whole years, and then we find out our favorite company Rare's making the new one, but it wasn't a real Star Fox game at all. Listen, dude, I waited nine years for Pikmin 3, and F-Zero fans are still waiting after 16. Don't you talk to me about waiting. Personally, I've always been very far removed from that sentiment. I never really cared for the Star Fox games. I don't think they're bad. In fact, I think Star Fox 64 is a pretty damn good game. But I can only play like two levels of it before I get bored because that genre is just not really my cup of tea. I've always really liked the cast of characters and the music and stuff, but my appeal in that kind of came from playing Smash Bros rather than Star Fox. I don't know, I've just always had a hard time getting into games that solely revolve around flying a plane or a ship or any sort of flying vehicle vehicle, it just doesn't really interest me, I'd much rather be able to get out of the ship and more thoroughly explore the area on foot. You know, games like Pikmin, Metroid, Zelda, that's what I was all about. So to you, it was this nonsensical departure from what a Star Fox game should be, and that's understandable, rightfully so, but to me, I was a kid reading my neighbor's Nintendo Power and I see that the new Star Fox game lets you get out of the R-Wing and explore on foot. 
that was a lot more in tune with what I wanted from a video game than just flying a spaceship. I grew up playing this game, and I have a lot of fond memories of it, so it kinda breaks my heart to see how ridiculously and overwhelmingly hated Rare's final project with Nintendo is. Do people really think this game is that bad, or do they just hate it because it's not what they wanted? I mean, we've had a real Star Fox game since then. I remember when Metal Gear Rising came out, everybody hated it for how much it betrayed all the basic conventions that made Metal Gear Metal Gear. Even when the trailer came out in 2011, it was met with its fair share of hatred, but now that we've had a mainline entry since then, people go back to it and they love it as the badass and visceral action game it is, instead of continuing to hate it for what it isn't. The Federation Force, do you remember the freaking petitions to cancel that thing? Do you remember not being able to go one freaking day without hearing at least one person complain about how much it's going to destroy the series? How many people do you still hear talking about how much they hate it now that we've had to real metro games announced since. Pikmin, my favorite series of all freaking time. It had a fourth installment in talk since 2015. Miyamoto even said it was almost done, but did I throw a tantrum when they announced Hey Pikmin instead? No, because I know what I want is still down the line. There's no sense in getting angry at it. There's no sense in spending so much energy in just hating something because it's not what you wanted. Yet it's a curious case with Star Fox Adventures because it seems like no matter how much time passes, I continue to see people hating the ever-loving crap out of this game. We should have been long past that vicious cycle of cynicism that I see again and again with video games, but for some reason, we're not here. And that really begs the question. Is this game really that bad? I mean, I loved it growing up, but I'm gonna replay it with a critical eye, because I'm genuinely curious. Rare. Man, that's kinda weak, actually. I mean, Rare is notorious for that glistening golden logo shimmering before any of their games load up, but... But here, it's just kind of a lifeless, still 2D image. Imagine knowing that this was gonna be the final game they ever made for Nintendo back then, and you boot it up to... this. Damn. I always really love the title screen here. The camera pans around to a different member of the Star Fox crew to represent each of the different menu items. Hopping over to Peppy here, we've got a widescreen option. I never really cared for GameCube widescreen because it crunches the image together so you can stretch it back out, and it doesn't look too bad, but the 2D elements like the HUD and the map, they're not compensated for, so they get stretched and it looks pretty bad. I'll stick with 4.3 for this playthrough. Alright, so we start with this opening that follows not Fox, but Crystal. We get a paragraph on screen explaining her backstory. I always thought it was a bit weird to dump all of this on us at once instead of, you know, exploring it gradually throughout the game's story. Though I did notice that this text dump does not seem to be in the original Dinosaur Planet version of this intro, which is really interesting. It's probably because Crystal was originally going to have a much bigger role in this game, but instead, here, she kind of gets put in the sidelines for the entire game after the first 20 minutes. That's probably why this text was slapped on the intro, since we're no longer exploring her character in favor of being Fox the entire game. Kind of a lame sacrifice if you ask me. I think it would have been a lot cooler to learn all of this as you play through the game gradually, instead of just getting it all at once from a text dump. Speaking of Crystal, am I the only one that really likes her dinosaur planet design way more than her final one? She was a lot more pudgy and cutesy looking on the N64, and I kind of think the addition of human like hair really made her stick out in a weird way because it's a little bit inconsistent with the rest of the cast. She's the only Star Fox character that has that. I, I think she looked better without it. In the end, they tried to make her more sexy looking so she'd be an obvious love interest for Fox, but that always made me a tad uncomfortable. You know, like sex appeal being applied to animal characters. I mean, I guess there's people that are into that, and hey, I'm not gonna judge. I uh, fully support whatever this is. I don't judge. But personally, I like my little animal dudes either cute as a button or badass looking. Kind of interesting how the very first bit of gameplay here actually is something that does somewhat resemble Star Fox. And this isn't even unique to this version either. This was carried on over from the original N64 build. Maybe that was part of Miyamoto's inspiration for pushing this as a Star Fox game. Who knows? I also know to work out 
One thing this first part is often criticized for is that fake dinosaur language, and I never really minded it too much. Honestly, I do really like the idea of the planet speaking a different language, because Crystal taking the time to learn it is a really good way of showing how devoted she is to her mission, how much she really cares. Unlike Fox, who just uses a digital translator, and he doesn't even want to be there, right? I think it's a really good way of showing a contrast between these two personalities and their attitudes towards the task at hand. The reason it sounds so weird weird is because when they speak the name of a location or a character, they still say that part in English. And yeah, I, I totally agree, it sounds clunky as hell. Kohud or Taskuki if dinosaur planet. General Scale! But the weirdest part about this, and I don't really think many people have noticed this, is that there's a cheat you can unlock that makes the subtitles the dinosaur language instead of English. And if you pay attention, you might notice that those subtitles don't say the English names, like General Scales. Instead, they actually say what the names are in the dinosaur language. That kind of makes me wonder, if they wrote these parts in the dinosaur language, if they have those versions of the names, why still say them in English and make the delivery so weird? I mean, I get that we wouldn't get to hear general scales out loud, but at least make the word general still in the dinosaur language, or better yet, make his name something that sounds normal in the dinosaur language, uh, something totally made up, and, and then still continue to say that in English. So uh, I think the dinosaur language uh, word for general is uh, wadahook or something like that. So let's say uh, wadahook skoro, and then later when they're speaking English, you could say general skoro. I don't know, I just made up Skaro. It could be any made up word name. So this whole beginning sequence establishes the villain, the mission, and the stakes. General Scales is a reptile dictator trying to rule the planet. After stealing the four spellstones from the temple, these four chunks of the planet were then separated from it. See, there's this force within the planet that's so great it's pushing the thing apart, so these spellstones were created to keep the planet together. But that's not the only thing that was scattered. Also, the six Krizoa spirits that created life on Dinosaur Planet were also hidden away to keep General Scales from using their powers for evil. So before you get each Krizoa spirit, you'll first have to pass a test, and some of these are okay, like this one that has you matching key items you found throughout the game to the areas you found them in. It's a fun little way of testing, like, how much you remember. Sometimes they're a little bit dumb, though, like this one that just has you picking which jar it's in. It's ridiculously easy, and this one's just a freaking manual from Tony Hawk. So it's Crystal's goal to find the Krizoa spirits, but that really doesn't last long before she's completely thrown out of the plot and stuck inside a literal crystal. Get it, it's her name. We then cut to the Star Fox team, who gets a similar distress call that Crystal did. They're tasked with finding the four spellstones to reunite the planet, but their motivation's a little less kind than Crystal's. They're in it for the money, and Fox will remind you as much as possible that he just wants to get paid and bounce. Contact General Pepper so we can get paid. <laughs> Are you sure you finished down there? Fox is kind of an asshole in this game. He's always complaining and, quite obviously, does not care about the well-being of this planet. He just wants to get everything over with, and that's really weird because it feels a little bit inconsistent with the Fox that we knew from Star Fox 64. Okay, enough already. Can I just get on with it? My guess is that the personality we're seeing here was never intended to be that of Fox, but instead, Saber. The original Dinosaur Planet plot would have worked really well with these two contrasting personalities and missions. On one hand, you have Crystal, the kind-spirited warrior who's finding the Krizoa spirits, and on the other hand, you have the more hot-headed Saber who's looking for the spellstones. Bouncing between these two and watching them grow as they interact with each other would have been really cool. But instead, since Crystal was kinda tossed from the equation, we're glued to this cynicism the entire time, and it is played for laughs, you know, it's Rare's trademark cynical British humor bleeding through the cracks, but it never comes off as funny to me. It's just like, it's just like, dude, stop being such a dickhead. Okay, okay, stop crying. I'll see what I can do. Fox, my boy, my dude, I'm getting real sick of your rude attitude. I do think the original plot would have worked a lot better. Like, it also makes a little bit more sense to pit Crystal against General Scales instead of Fox because she had a closer beef with him in the beginning. Fox only, like, hears about him and just wants to stop him, right? Oh, on that note, I do think Scales is a pretty badass villain. Like, the way he drags Crystal across the ground and throws her overboard, he is ruthless and intimidating as hell. Not to mention, his character 
design is pretty rad. I love that little hook hand he's got. It's really not that hard to tell that this game's story is a retooling of something that originally flowed a little bit better and was originally a lot more interesting too. In fact, the condensed storyline for Dinosaur Planet is available on RareThief.com. I highly recommend you read it if you're into that sort of thing. I'll put a link down in the description below in case you want to check it out. I guess the plot still works, like you hit all of the main points and you arrive at a conclusion just fine, but it feels a little bit standard now, you know? And there's also a lot of little clunky moments that you realize make a little bit more sense when considering that Crystal was supposed to be in some of these scenes instead of Fox. It's actually really interesting noticing that sort of thing. Now, a lot of people have labeled this game as a simple Zelda clone, and well, I guess I really can't lie, the similarities are pretty blatant, like the uh, camera system relying on a single button push to refocus your view, to the automatic jumping when you walk off a ledge, the crawling through tight spaces, the animation for collecting an item, hitting buttons on the wall with a projectile, the roll move, the magic meter, the health meter, the wallet upgrades, it is undeniably copying the basic conventions of Ocarina of Time. However, while it does use the same blueprint, it still manages to feel quite unique from a Zelda game. I mean, for starters, you can drag the block sideways, that's such a good improvement. I really wish the 3D Zeldas adopted that feature. I also love how you can slide down the ladders, it's a lot of fun. The combat's also really different. When you have your staff drawn near an enemy, the camera automatically locks into your target, and you'll use the A button combined with the direction on the stick to execute different attacks. Though, I guess I would be lying if I didn't say the combat was really shallow and incredibly basic. All it really boils down to is holding up on the stick and mashing the A button and like occasionally blocking. Like I said, there are other moves you can use by holding different directions and some of which you can even execute out of a roll dodge and they are pretty cool, but none of them, none of them are nearly as effective as just holding up and mashing A. So get ready to view the exact same animation over and over and over. Not to mention every time there's multiple enemies, you don't have to worry about dealing with more them one at a time. They either just wait their turn or they swing at the arrow like an idiot. It is 100% style over substance. It looks cool and it is kind of entertaining and satisfying, but you're not really doing a whole lot here. I don't know, I just kind of wish it was a little bit more involved and challenging. I think the game is definitely at its strongest when you're doing the exploring. The hub world does that really cool thing where you see a lot of things you can't interact with yet, and it makes you wonder, uh, wait, what the hell do I do with this? Oh, uh, maybe later on, I'll unlock a cool new move that lets me get past this. It's a little bit like Mario Sunshine, where they deliberately litter Delfino Plaza with all of these things you can't deal with yet. The green doors, the pineapple in the pipe, the orange goo areas that are too high to get to, and right in front of you where you start are the two extra nozzles you have yet to unlock. Notice how Flood cuts himself off right before he says what the nozzle is. That's not a coincidence, they do that on purpose because it's things like this that make you excited to play on to see what new tools you'll get your hands on. Star Fox Adventures does this too. Well, not quite as effectively as Mario Sunshine. In fact, sometimes it straight up tells you what the thing you're looking at is. I think it would have been better to leave it as a mystery until you find out for yourself. But even still, finding these things in the overworld made me really excited to play further into the game and unlock more moves. That's a really big thing this game centers around, this item menu full of tools, commands, and staff abilities. Fox finds Crystal staff after he lands on Dinosaur Planet, and it's not just for fighting enemies. Sometimes you'll find a grotto that'll fit your staff with a brand new ability. This ranges from a projectile attack to a boost to a ground slam move. I hate the aiming for the fireball thingy. It's the same clunky aiming controls from Jet Force Gemini, the kind that has a reticle snapping back to the center if you let go of the stick, so you have to hold it in a really uncomfortably specific spot to land your shots accurately. Granted, with the better stick and hardware, it does feel a lot smoother than Jet Force did, but I still wish they dropped this in favor of, like, good aiming. I mean, I could forgive it if it was still an N64, but this is the GameCube, like, Wind Waker had pretty good aiming, so they can do it, they just didn't. There's a pretty good variety of these staff powers, and while there's, like, not a whole lot of thinking involved regarding what move you need to use to solve each puzzle, it's still pretty fun to apply the correct tool to any given situation. Like finding out you have to shoot down these stalactites in the ceiling to make platforms, or using the ground slam move to take out these big dinosaurs you couldn't deal with before. There's also a pretty cool sharp claw disguise you can use. This one's really neat because it's straight out of Jet Force Gemini. I love seeing 
ideas from previous games make a comeback in new ones. Though, the way they handle it really isn't that interesting this time. You only needed to open these doors that require standing on a tile while wearing it. That's really it. I mean, you can also use it to sneak past enemies if you don't want to deal with them, but there's no point in the game where this is really required or made interesting, like you're undercover or something. I guess there's the Cloudrunner Fortress with these things that zap you when you're spotted, but they're pretty easy to avoid, even without the disguise. It's a great idea, they just didn't really do much with it. Kind of makes me wonder if originally there was maybe more to it in the N64 version? Like, imagine going undercover at a Sharpclaw Fortress and talking to a bunch of different NPCs, doing trade with the Sharpclaw Underworld to get a key item or something. That would have been really cool. Staff powers aside, there's also Prince Tricky, who plays an integral role in solving the game's puzzles. You've got a list of commands, like stay to get him to hold down buttons and stuff, or find, which has him digging up items and tunnels to crawl through. He even learns a fire-breathing command you can use to melt some ice. I find it really funny how you can beat the absolute crap out of Tricky, and if you do it enough, he breathes fire on you, but if you do it before he learns how to do that, he can't do anything about it. He just sits there and takes it. The poor dinosaur, good lord. Now, why would you want to be a Prince Tricky? Well, a lot of people kind of found him really annoying back in the day, like, you know, the typical partner complaints like Navi or whatever, but that sort of thing, of course, is always really overplayed. I mean, like, the poor dude literally can't even breathe without angry goblins complaining about it on Reddit. No, like, I really wish I was joking. The most annoying he ever gets is having to hear a quiet voice clip that goes, Let's play! every now and then, but I find that more funny than I do annoying, like when he asked to do it in, like, a deadly volcano. Let's play! Tricky, come on, time and place, you, no. Speaking of which, you can actually get this ball so you can play fetch with him. There's not really a whole lot of point in doing it, but I guess if you do do it enough, he changes color? Okay, weird. Oh, and the shop you buy the ball from actually has a pretty big role in the game. There's a couple of key items you'll have to buy there, but there's also these maps you can get to uh, various locations. And I love the idea of Fox having to buy his own binoculars back from the dude because he found them on the ground. You stingy dick. They also try to have, like, this bartering system where you can make different offers to get a better deal, and it's a really cool idea, but the way it's implemented is just, like, really primitive. There's a very specific lowest price he'll take for any given item, so it's just a matter of, like, guessing a low number, him saying no, and then guessing again and again and again until you get one that'll take. It's not really worth sitting through all the extra dialogue for, and you're only ever gonna save, like, what, two or three scarabs of most things anyway? Speaking of which, I always loved how there's this hidden room back here behind this fake wall where you can get a good chunk of scarabs. That always came in handy in case I was a little bit short. You know, I always wondered why the hell this game was given a T rating. The back of the box says it's for animated blood, so as a kid, I would spend every playthrough I balling the entire game for a trace, a lick, a shred of what could possibly be considered blood here. Some people say it's the red lines that come out of Tricky when you hit him, but that's that's definitely not blood. That's action lines. Like, the same thing happens when you hit a rock or a tree. It's just different colors. I always thought that it was, I don't know, maybe the red smoke that comes out of the enemy health bars when you hit them, but, like, that's from a health thing. It's not even coming out of the enemy. It's definitely not meant to be blood. I really just think the ESRB goofed on this one. But anyway, the last page of this item menu covers items and key items. You'll get stuff like bomb spores you can use to plant exploding plants, you can use to blow open walls, you get fireflies to light dark areas, moon seeds to plant these vines you can climb up. There's a lot of neat stuff in here. One thing in here that always kind of befuddled me were these fuel cells. Like, there's a handful of times in the game where you have to use the R-Wing to access a new area, but you'll first need enough of these collectible fuel cells to do that. But the thing is, there was never, ever, ever a time when I didn't have enough. They're so easy to find, and I don't even think you really need that many of them. I think this was a remnant of Rare's obsession with collecting stuff that was maybe toned down a notch during the transition to a Star Fox game, so it just becomes this totally meaningless thing you don't even have to think about or notice. Oh, and uh, yeah, there's the harrowing sections. It's funny, I forget about that because it's a freaking Star Fox game. These actually play pretty well, like uh, pretty much imagine Star Fox 64, but with slightly smoother controls. They're over before you know it though, so it's really not hard to tell they were just shoehorned in for the sake of being able to call this a Star Fox game. At least these sections look pretty. I mean, the entire game looks pretty damn good. In fact, I would argue this is probably one of the better looking games on the system. Fox's model is incredibly detailed. I don't mean just like the polygon count, but the detail in his eyes and the fur, the fur looks amazing and the environments are absolutely incredible to look at. They're so luscious and colorful and, and there's a great variety in them too. My favorite looking area in the game is probably right here. It's got this autumn look to it with the dew on the ground and the low hanging fog and it, it is just a beautiful looking spot. 
But uh, while this game looks fantastic, it doesn't really sound that great. There are so many stock sound effects in this game, and I'm not going to pretend that's anything new because like Rares always use stock sounds a bunch in their games, but it's a little bit more acceptable on N64 because by this generation, especially with CD quality audio, people have spent a number of years already hearing those sounds and you're kind of expecting new ones. <laughs> I think the absolute worst for me is like the stock animal cries from when you kill an enemy. It's like, that is not the sound that should be coming out of this dinosaur. And oh god, the laugh these things make is so freaking annoying. I hate it. And this problem even gets carried on a little bit over into the music. I mean, it's definitely not going to be something that most people will notice, but anybody that's into music production and deals with a lot of samples has probably heard these vocal tracks before. I mean, these are not something that was recorded for the game. I've been told they're actually off of a CD called Heart of Africa, Volume 1. <laughs> It's really not going to be a big deal or a deal at all to most people, but if you're a musician who's familiar with those samples, that can pull you right out of the experience. And I kind of do know that feeling firsthand, because when I was in college, we learned Logic Pro, and one of our assignments was just to make a song out of the samples that came out of the box. So, I made this. It's just a silly, like, funky song with some didgeridoos and, like, some weird foreign-sounding instruments that I didn't recognize because I just thought that sounded interesting and goofy and fun, so... That's what I made. And then Xenoblade Chronicles X comes out, and guess what I hear in the game's music? Yeah, that's the exact same sample I put in my stupid-ass college song. Like, I don't hear music anymore. All I can see is the frickin' Logic Pro timeline. Like, it just completely shattered that soundtrack for me. But, uh, the sampled audio aside, I'd still say the soundtrack is pretty dang good. It was primarily done by David Wise, after all, and that dude's composed some of the best video game songs of all time. Oh yeah, that that is one of them. That is like one of my favorite video game songs of all time. You ever see the PPF cover? Oh my god, that's probably my favorite piece of music ever made. Oh, here's a part of the game I always hated. Uh, you get kidnapped by this dinosaur tribe that makes you do these two tests to get the Grozoa spirit. Uh, the one where you just activate all the totem poles, that one's easy, but this one you have to mash the A button as fast as you can to beat the, the strong man. <sighs> I always had such a hard time beating this as a kid. Actually, you know what? No, I never beat this as a kid. I'd either get my dad to do it for me, or I'd borrow a friend's Mad Cat's controller with turbo. Oh man, it's been a long time since I've tried doing this, but I'm not a kid anymore. I'm an adult. I have newfound strength. I am powerful. So, uh, let's give it a go. <laughs> oh, I beat it in literally five seconds. I, well, I, it, I was gonna do this bit where, like, I couldn't beat this, and I was gonna, like, need a turbo button controller, but I don't have one for GameCube, so I was gonna do, like, this obtuse solution where I use my, my N64 turbo button controller and, like, use some RAFNET cables to plug it into the GameCube, and that would have been some funny joke, but I guess, I guess that's out the window. Um, while I got this plugged in, I may as well, like, see what it would have done with the turbo function. Uh, let's see how fast this goes. 4.7 seconds, okay, so like only about half a second faster than what I did. Okay, yeah, damn, I guess kids are just really bad at mashing buttons then. Oh, wow, you know what, I'm still playing this with that N64 controller, and this is like really interesting. Like that menu, you control the C-stick, oh my god, look at this, look at this. That makes so much more sense, wow. So like, I guess if there's anything like major I'd have to criticize in this game, uh, for starters, it'd be the lack of fast travel. There are too many times you have to go all the way back to a previous area on foot, and like, some rooms along the way can get really redundant. This game really loves those transition areas where you gotta use like a device or do some specific action to get by, and like, yeah, it's pretty neat having Tricky stay on the button so you can climb up and hit the switch to change the water flow, but like, when you're doing it for like the sixth freaking time, it gets kinda old. There's a lot of areas like this, like that wind tunnel before Moon Mountain Pass, remember going down and then back up every time you wanna go there or back, and that maze, and then also after the maze, like the well where you gotta go down the ladder and then back up the ladder right before Cape Claw, it gets on your nerves after a bit. The pacing in general really 
falls apart in the game's second half, which is probably a result of scrapping story segments to make the plot work with just Fox. So basically the game has this really nice chapter loop where you spend the game searching for one of the four guardians, they open up a gate in the sky that you fly through in the R-Wing, and then you access one of the four planet chunks that drifted off into orbit. Now the first two actually do have really great pacing. You undertake a quest to find the guardian on the main planet, and then you continue that quest line second half off the planet. And then it wraps up with you playing through a temple to return the spellstone. It's all good stuff, and I actually really like it. But then the second two, you just find the guardian so fast after like, no effort. The third guardian turns out to be Tricky's dad, and that does raise an interesting problem because he's stuck in the floating chunk and he can't open the gate for you, so you gotta find a seal that he hid back here on Dinosaur Planet. But you just kinda get a staff upgrade and open the door and it's done. Like, like I thought you were gonna have to journey out into a really interesting location and do a quest for it, but like, no, it's, it's just kinda right here in the main village. The fourth one's the absolute worst though, it's just a random ass dinosaur in the main village, are you kidding? There's no interesting quest behind it at all, you just go up to him and talk to him and you go to the next level right away! And then after returning from these two levels, they reuse the first two temples. Uh, granted, you do take a slightly different path through them, so it's not too redundant, but it's a far cry from how interesting it could have been if they had four totally unique temples instead. It really feels like the game had to be rushed to meet a deadline before they started working for Microsoft, because it really feels like there were two quests that had to have been dropped from the final game. But I think the game's biggest defense here is easily how it totally cheaps you out on a proper final battle. Like, they hype up general scales so much throughout the game, and when you finally get to fight them... Now, you must face me! Stop! Wow, did you see that? Did you see how long he was on screen for, like, coming towards me with the game just, like, stopped and went to a cutscene? Like, not even two seconds. You don't get a proper fight with him at all. Just a, a cutscene plays where some voice is like, I'm the actual villain. You, you can go away now, Scales. And you don't get to fight him. And they have the nerve to tease you with, like, one second of actual gameplay that looks like you're about to fight the dude, too. Well, actually, it can be a bit longer if you know what to do. Or rather, what not to do. Uh, drawing your weapon is what really triggers this cutscene, so for most people, you probably hit the A button right away and uh, got the cutscene immediately, but if you don't hit any buttons, he jumps around the arena like a freaking kangaroo. He doesn't even attack you. It's hilarious. I think you all know what's coming. Uh, Andros comes out of nowhere. You gotta have the final battle with him instead. It's so cheaply written and out of nowhere. Come to think of it, I think I remember reading something about like how this was always intended to happen, even in Dinosaur Planet. Uh, the bad guy turning out to be somebody different and it cheating you out of a fight with scales. I wish I could find it though, I can't. Um, so if that's true, I guess it wasn't actually the transition to a Star Fox game that's at fault for this. It would have been the same before, just with, you know, somebody that isn't Andros. I cannot confirm that though. If somebody has, like, access to what I might be remembering, please, please tell me. Because I, I could just be talking out my ass, I don't remember. I actually hear a lot of people mention how this game should have stayed an N64 game, and I don't really think I entirely agree with that. The game would not have looked this good if it stayed on N64, and like at 60 FPS too? It is bonkers to me how Mario Sunshine only hits 30, yet this game manages to look 10 times better and at double the frame rate. It is, it is so clean. Rare's always been one to push the hardware, but on N64 that usually sacrificed the frame rate, like uh, Jet Force Gemini for example. It is a beautiful looking game for its time, but the frame rate just wasn't there. Here on GameCube though, you get the best of both worlds. They were able to make it look amazing and optimize it well too. But while I am glad it is on the GameCube, I do fully agree that it should have stayed as Dinosaur Planet because Man, I firmly believe, with 100% certainty, if this was never converted to a Star Fox title, not a soul on this earth would hate it. Even if it was identical, if it was even the same freaking game, same levels and everything, even with the cut content and the rush second half, if this was the same freaking thing but with the original story and characters, it would instead be remembered as a flawed yet still fun rare classic. But it's not, because people literally, and I don't use that word often, people literally only hate it because it's Star Fox. Jet Force Gemini, for example, I think that game is okay. 
but it's remembered really fondly, even if it's one of their more niche titles. But imagine if that got transformed into a third-person linear Metroid game. Nobody would remember it that way. Your perception of something completely the same would be totally skewered just because of the property they used. And honestly, I think Star Fox Adventures is a better game than Jet Force. I do think it is kind of average in a lot of areas. There's really nothing here you're going to be doing that Zelda has not already done a lot better, but it's still a well-made, competent, and fun game. There's nothing here I would argue was outright done poorly. It may be rough around the edges and a little sloppy with the pacing, but nothing I think is outright bad. And if it trumps Zelda in any area, it's definitely in the environment design and the exploration. That stuff here is top freaking notch. This game is a bizarre mishandlement of ideas and properties, a weird mutation of something that was planned to be a little bit different, but all things considered, I think this game turned out to be pretty okay. It definitely does not deserve the hate it gets, that much I can say with utmost confidence. I really hope we'll get to see the original Dinosaur Planet someday. I really want a playable ROM to get leaked online, even if it's just like one room that lets you play with some of the game's abilities, but my ultimate dream would be have a next-gen game made from scratch that covers the original story. It'll definitely never happen, but that would be pretty dang amazing. Or Nintendo could just stop being cowards and make Star Fox Adventures 2 already. I mean, everybody would hate them for it, but hey, I wouldn't complain. I still like this game. I mean, I admit it doesn't hold a candle to the series it's borrowing so much from. If Zelda's an A+, this is probably, I don't know, B-, minus, C+, plus? but that's still a passing grade. Just because it's not as good and it's not what you wanted doesn't mean it's inherently a bad game. And again, I firmly believe if this was not a Star Fox game, I guarantee you it would have been remembered as a Rareware classic. So, why don't we just get over ourselves already? This is a Nintendo Rareware classic the last one. And while you might still think this game sucks, well, whatever. I admit they didn't go out with a bang, but I would argue it wasn't a whimper either. It was more like a confused, awkward goodbye. Yo, hey, thank you so much for watching. This is one I've been wanting to make for years because it's just one of those games I grew up with that I always thought people treated a little bit unfairly. But uh, yeah, if you'd like to support the channel, Brady and I have a podcast on our Patreon for $1 a month. And if you want to lose some brain cells, you can follow me on Twitter and see more of my dumb bullshit. But uh, yeah, thanks for watching, and I guess I'll see you guys again soon.